The Centurion Project Written by the Eighth Day of Night Chapter 8 The First Week Journal Entry Day 768? 769, probably. I didn't do much today. Tried to scavenge, but the weather was too cold. And I got robbed last week. Somebody got in and took all my clothes, so now all I have is what's on my back. I decided to lay bait and set up a nasty trap that I saw in an old book. Well, a pun stick trap, I think. Doesn't matter. I made sure to sharpen the stakes nice and pointy. And I have a bottle of bleach stashed nearby, too. If I'm lucky, I will catch them alive. Payback is gonna be a bitch. Elias scratched his head as he stared blankly at the wall. The prison cell was a bit chilly, but he honestly didn't care much. He had begun slipping into apathy after the second day, but this little visit just made it worse. In truth, he wished the cell was a bit more run down and dank, but at least give him something to do, something to complain to himself about. Instead, he was stuck in a perfectly maintained stone cell. Each gray wall was as featureless as the next. The steel bars were in pristine condition, not even a spot of rust on them. Elias groaned in boredom, unable to find anything to occupy his mind with the picture-perfect cell. His weeks had been a tidal wave of anger and irritation, with each new day bringing something new to further drive a spike into his forehead. After he had left Anyon and Luna cackling behind him, he had waited in the corridor, shutting off their mockery as he studied his sword, swinging it through the air as he tested its weight, ensuring that it hadn't changed enough to throw him off balance if he got into a fight. Luna had eventually come out of the blacksmith's room, and she offered no apology for her mockery. Instead, she had remained silent while she led him around the castle, showing him important locations. The armory, the cafeteria, the training grounds. The last stop had been the castle tailor who had looked upon Elias' tunic and sandals with greater disdain than Luna or Anion. She assured both Elias and Luna that he would have an array of new clothing and shoes that would be just as functional as his current gear, while also being more durable and, quote-unquote, more befitting a member of the guard. Elias wasn't wearing any of that clothing yet. Despite the fact that the unicorn had finished it within 24 hours, Elias was still unsure about it. It looked far too soft to take the punishment he submitted to his clothing. When asked, he said he was saving it for when he started his guard duties. Elias closed his eyes and his head thudded against the stone wall. The day was now likely farther away. And he couldn't tell if he was angry about that, that he couldn't get it over with already, or glad that he didn't have to interact with anyone yet. After the visit with the tailor, Luna had dropped Elias by his quarters. Somewhere around 7 in the morning? giving him a small schedule for the next night. Nightshade was supposed to stop by his room promptly at 6pm to wake him up, with the intention of getting his body naturally prepared for sleep during the day. Unfortunately for her, Elias was gone by that time, his night terrors driving him awake almost as soon as he fell asleep. Using the map on the back of his schedule, Elias found his way to the library at night, at the early hour of 11am. He was surprised when he found Twilight there, was even more surprised when she just silently waved when she spotted him. He had expected the pony to jump in for more information, but she simply continued reading, letting the human go in peace. It didn't take Elias long to get lost in a long row of books, and he picked out several small books on simple subjects, primarily history. He then settled against a bookshelf and began reading, losing track of time as he tore through page after page. He didn't even look up until he began hearing series of pops, when he did, he saw a series of purple flashes. To his credit, Elias only jumped a little when Twilight appeared beside him, with a very angry-looking nightshade beside her. That had been the first time he had gotten yelled at by the Thestral, a species he had learned about in a biology book that had snuck its way into his stack. Throughout the dressing down, Elias couldn't help but to watch Twilight curiously as she went through the stack of books he collected. As Nightshade's tirade lengthened into tens of minutes, the unicorn would disappear with a book, then returned with three, setting them beside his pile before combing through it once more. By the time Nightshade had finished, the stack of books was nearly as tall as he was, 
and had been split into three separate stacks. Twilight, however, looked completely satisfied with herself. Perched atop the books as she waited for Nightshade to stop. When she did, the Thestral looked at Stack in awe. I don't remember that many books being there before, she said. Twilight smiled. I just handed a few references and newer versions of some books Elias had picked out. She rubbed the back of her head sheepishly. I've kind of got a whole list prepared if we ever came in contact with a foreign species, and I may or may not have filled out a list so that Elias would have a basic knowledge of equestrian history culture, as well as flora, fauna, and pony biology. That's the basics? Nightshade asked, dumbfounded. I haven't read that many books in my entire life. Twilight scoffed, waving her hoof dismissively. Maybe not all at once, Captain, but this includes stuff that gets taught to cults and fillies in the schools. Elias is starting with no knowledge. He needs everything. He's got so much homework to do. Elias flinched at the word homework. He enjoyed reading as much as he enjoyed breathing, but homework? It had been the only bullet he had dodged in the apocalypse. All of his schooling was self-taught past an elementary level. It allowed him to pick up a myriad of useful skills, as well as study what he enjoyed, like ancient Mediterranean or European cultures. There, were no, there was no homework, though. If he became disinterested with a subject, he abandoned it. Still, Elias knew he had an out, and it was in the form of sling on his arm. Twilight, there's no way I can carry all of that, he said, pointing to the cast decorating his forearm. The unicorn scoffed again. <laughs> Just put it in your enchanted saddlebags. All guards have them. I know because Shiny gave me his old set when he got promoted. Guardsman Bright hasn't been issued saddlebags, nor has he received much of his equipment. Nightshirt responded. She glared at the man. In fact, we are supposed to be getting that equipment now. If Guardsman Bright had been in his room on time... Elias gestured to the long shelves and blank walls. There are no clocks in here. How am I supposed to keep track of time? Count? You're supposed to use your standard issue pocket watch, guardsman, Nightshade snapped back. This is all covered in your training manual. Elias placed his hand on his hip. Do you mean the standard issue watch that I haven't gotten yet? Or perhaps the training manual, which I also haven't received? Nightshade opened her mouth to respond, then stopped. She flushed red in anger, mostly because she knew he had gone one up on her. If you had been in your room this entire time, instead of wandering around, we would have been on time, she shouted. Then she reached beneath her armor, drawing forth a blue and black watch, handing it to Elias. Here, it's magically synced with every other watch in the Canterlot Castle. This is how you will stay on time at all times. It also acts as an alarm system if there are any major security threats. Elias clicked it open with his thumb, noting a flashing blue light on the inside face. Is this meant to be an alarm? He asked, flipping it around to show the flashing light to Nightshade. The Thestral looked away in embarrassment. It is. I uh, may or may not have sounded an escape alarm when you weren't in your room. I should alert the all clear before you get pounced. Elias clutched the watch closed, wrapping the chain around his sword belt before he tucked it into an empty pouch. Escape? So I am a prisoner, then. Nightshade rubbed her nose with a hoof. Technically, you're an escaped mental patient until Dr. Scalpel and Princess Luna clear you. You are free to wander wherever you like. I just... Her ears drooped. I panicked when you weren't in your room. It is my responsibility to keep track of all the guards. And I thought you had vanished. Maybe losing it after everything that's happened. Sorry. Elias felt conflicted. On one hand, he felt intense anger for two reasons. The first of which was that he was considered a mental patient and a flight risk. The second was that, even if it was an honest excuse, he was still being treated like a prisoner. There was no trust. The small voice in the back of his mind was screaming at him just to accept it, to think of it like a parole it was. He hadn't earned their trust yet, and therefore he should wait before getting angry. Elias decided to listen to this void, partly. He clamped down on his emotions and put his usual grim expression on his face, leaving his voice neutral. It's fine, he responded curtly. Let's just get started. What are we supposed to be doing first? 
After that, Elias took all the books to his room, with help of course, and then he had Nightshade made their way to the medical ward. He was greeted by an enthusiastic scalpel, who hadn't even noticed the fact that they were nearly an hour late. Elias was quickly dragged into a bed where Scalpel began his healing treatments, all while directing a pair of nurses that ran about pell-mell preparing what Elias imagined were a series of tests. His eyes twitched when he saw some instruments that got laid out, but he wouldn't show weakness. If these were standard for ponies, he was more than capable of taking it. Once the healing was complete and his arm was free, both its sling and cast, the test started with a questionnaire, an in-depth questionnaire, that alone took two hours. The questions ranged from how he was physically feeling, to his medical history, of which there was none, to what he liked to do for fun. More than once Elias had to pass a question either because it had no answer, or because he didn't want to address the answers he had. The longer the questioning went on, the more irritated he got, which Elias had no doubt also went down on the sheet, which just further fed into his anger. When Elias reached the point where he felt like he was going to snap, Scalpel moved on. Yet Elias stripped his clothes, and unfortunately that meant all of them. Elias Scalpel had a shouting match where the pony told him that he had to lose the briefs as well, and while Scalpel had said it was purely for medical reasons, Elias pointed out that Nightshade was still in the room. The Thestral had only grinned in response, saying nothing, as Scalpel forcefully asserted that she was supposed to be there. Elias didn't believe him for a second. In a dastardly act of privacy invasion, Scalpel had eventually just teleported the underwear away, leaving Elias with no clothes and a flushed face. He grumbled while the unicorn did his tests, moving quickly and efficiently through them. It was the only reason Elias didn't strike the pony. After poking and prodding and collecting some extremely private and vile samples, Scalpel gave Elias his briefs back, which Elias had put back in under a second. After that, it had been relatively standard as Scalpel poked and prodded at Elias's numerous scars, as well as his extremely visible ribs. Everything he said was written down, and the questions came again. Less personal, and therefore easier to answer. Scalpel asked him about his dietary needs. While Elias wasn't an expert on the perfect diet, he had a fair grasp of what he needed. As the test seemed to be winding down, Elias felt like he was in the clear. He had managed to stay relatively calm. He had only one close call. That was until... So Elias, let's talk about your markings on your back, Scalpel said, gesturing for Elias to take a seat in the stool in the center of the room. Elias sat down, but he did so hunched over, clasping his hands in front of him. His paranoia spiked up. Which ones? Elias asked. Be aware, some of those stories won't be told. Scalpel nodded as he sat in the rolling chair and rolled around to Elias's back, his warm hooves lightly prodding at several different spots. Only answer what you feel comfortable with, Elias. I don't want you to be unhappy in any way. This is just so I can begin to get an idea of some of your past traumas. It will help me come up with several therapy strategies that may ease the effects on your night terrors non-magically. Elias sodded and nod. Strictly speaking, that was something that he wanted. He didn't know enough about magic yet, and he certainly didn't trust anything that affected his mental state. Fine. Pick one and let's get this done. Let's start with the biggest marking. Not the why, but the what, Scalpel said, his hoof running down the scar that Elias knew cut the red eagle tattoo in two. It seemed to be in the style of a cutie mark, but of course the location is all wrong, and it lacks any magical signature whatsoever. Furthermore, I wouldn't say it's an equestrian tattoo, because while weak in magic, they still emit something. The only comparison I can make of this marking would be an unnaturally abnormal birthmark, or, in all likelihood, it is similar to the Minotaur rune tattoos. If it's that, I would like to know why you would submit to that kind of physical torment. Elias looked over his shoulder. First, I need to know what these rune tattoos are. How are they put on? Scalpel sighed as he prodded the edges of the tattoo. Minotaurs use a needle, a hammer, and berry ink to quite literally carve runes into their skin. It is a very painful and permanent process. Equestrian tattoos are much safer, and, more importantly, removable. No risk of infection, no regrets if you don't like it afterwards. Drunk bets can be removed in a flash. Elias snorted and turned back forward. It's not quite as ugly as you described. Humans use actual ink. But yes, 
It is similar to the Minotaur rune tattoos. Needle and all. The whole piece took hours to complete. Scalpel sighed. <sighs> I was afraid you would say that. Is there any particular reason you did this to yourself? Then? Because it was the reward I gave my legionaries for, for completing their training. The legion symbol and the names of every single legionnaire. Two hundred names. Elias smiled for a second, and then his eyes fell, and he looked down at his hands. Now it serves as a reminder. That's all I can say about it. Scalpel nodded, and Elias felt his hoof on a particularly nasty scar near his left hip. And this one? It appears to be a brand, but I highly doubt that it's self-administered. Hopefully not another reward. Elias bit his cheek. Nope. A nasty group. Killed 300 people in four separate settlements. I tracked them down and captured, unfortunately. It was the same group that took a few toes when I escaped and I returned. Killed most of them, and then I... His jaw snapped, nearly biting the lip of his tongue off as he rethought the rest of his statement. I executed the rest as well. Nobody does what they did and get away with it. There are some lines that you never cross, and they did so and never looked back. They got what they earned. Elias could feel Scalpel's frown on his back. The unicorn didn't press the issue, however. Merely stood and gestured for Elias to redress. He did so swiftly, wincing slightly as his recently healed chest wound pooled, the tender flesh still not entirely mobile. As Elias slipped on his sandals and looped on his sword belt, Scalpel gestured he retake a seat. Elias sat, this time facing the unicorn. Scalpel sighed as he looked into the clipboard notes. I really don't know what to say to you, Elias. It's clear that none of this is your fault. I just wish I knew more about your developing years. Elias noted Elias' scowl, but continued. Being unwilling to talk about it tells me enough, Elias. I have no more questions for you today. This is my recommendation, however. First, we should bring your physical state back. Nothing about your body appears healthy. I will know specifically what needs remedy when the tests come back, but right now, you are sleep-deprived, dehydrated, and teetering on the edge of starvation. How you kept going in this state, adding injuries along the way, I might add, is a testament to your endurance, if nothing else. Scalpel looked to Nightshade. He isn't performing any duties this week, and if he's still skinny by the end of the week, he won't do any another week. Elias groaned. I'm fine. I'm sitting around doing nothing will make my mental state worse, not better. Scalpel glared at him. Tough. Use the time to fulfill your promises to talk with Miss Sparkle and Earth Cultures. Find a hobby. Do you seem to lack any other then? He flipped through a few pages of his clipboard up. Reading and combat training. He looked at Elias. Those aren't hobbies. I mean, reading is. But you can't be your whole day. You need to socialize. Find something physically relaxing to do. Keeping mentally occupied is one thing, but you need to be emotionally occupied as well. Otherwise, all we're doing is putting a band-aid on a broken bone. Elias looked at the pony for a second, trying and failing to hold his gaze. He looked away as he stood. Thanks for the checkup, Doc, but I'm fine. I just need something to do. Everything fades with time. Scalpel sighed. That's not true, and we both know it, Elias. Just... Nothing physically strenuous. If nothing else, we'll fix your body before it gives out. It won't last this long at this pace. Make sure you eat something. I know you skipped breakfast. Midnight snorted as she pushed away out of her seat. Don't worry, Doc. I'll make sure he gets healthy. She smiled sadistically at Elias. Even if I have to hurt him to do it. The rest of that day had included four meals all of which were far too large for one person to eat. After which she was met by Twilight and Luna in the library. Twilight spent the first four hours asking questions after question. Made worse when Elias went off on another tangent, or another about some minuscule aspect of human culture. Each word seemed to spark a dozen new questions, and by the time she simply collapsed from exhaustion around midnight, she had a stack of notes that would fill several books. Elias hadn't even gotten started, and what he did talk about was primarily ancient cultures, not really his own. He was going to be talking for the rest of eternity before that unicorn was satisfied. After that, he and Luna simply sat and stared at each other as a pair of guards stole the sleeping twilight away, taking her mountains of notes with her. As an hour rolled by, followed swiftly by another, 
Elias began to grow irritated. Luna just sat and stared at him, not blinking for minutes at a time. Whenever he opened his mouth to speak, to ask what the purpose of this exercise was, she would merely raise a hoof of silence. And so, Elias brooded, sorting through what he knew and didn't know, as well as he, what he still wanted to know. What he was slim, but he did have cursory knowledge of ponies now, or at least those who operate around the castle. Professionalism was the first for them, though for most friendliness wasn't far behind. While Elias was a curiosity, he wasn't treated with outright fear or disgust. Evidently, a bipedal, largely hairless creature wasn't the strangest thing they had seen. He couldn't tell if that was a positive thing or not. It did tell him that they were numb to oddities, and therefore prepared. Or did the friendliness demonstrate weakness that indicated they were completely unprepared if a real threat appeared? Elias zoned back in, his eyes still staring into Luna as she stared back. The princess at least seemed cautious enough. If anything, that bit of paranoia on her was comforting. It was at the same time as it was irritating as they kept him trapped here. If it was an attempt to reconditioning him, it has been the strangest form he had ever seen. He had been beaten, burned, starved, cut, drowned, beaten some more, but brainwashing by... friendship? Was that the game here? Elias slid out the handy pocket watch he had been given and checked the time. Fifteen till six. They had been sitting and doing nothing for nearly six hours. Elias sighed and replaced the watch before he looked back at Luna, who had watched the action with disinterest. Princess, if I may, what is the purpose of this? He asked, for once uninterrupted. This time could have been spent doing something useful. Luna tilted her head. Such as? Elias gestured to the books surrounding them. Reading? Or getting started on whatever? He pulled out the schedule he had been given and read the last entry on the list. Emotional dream therapy is... I won't pretend to understand what that is. I'll just assume that thrown together sentences like that are magic speak and that I don't and will never understand. Luna tilted her head. Dream magic is accessible to all sentient creatures, Godsman. With careful practice, you could even access it with ease. As for the therapy session, that is what we have been doing. You have stated previously that you require actions to keep your darkest thoughts at bay, yet we have sat in silence for hours without a major negative reaction. I must say I am impressed, Godsman. I thought you would speak up sooner than this. She looked to the bootcases. Or, at the very least, find something to read. Doing nothing can be quite dull if one does not know how to do it properly. Elias raised a finger and opened his mouth, then closed it. He ran a hand through his stubble a few times as he tried to suppress his anger. She was mocking him, as was the voice at the back of his head. He wanted to stab it. Instead of committing bodily harm to a piece of his psyche, Elias dropped his hand and strained up in his seat. With your permission, can I go back to my room now? Elias asked. Luna nodded calmly. Of course, Godsman. I shall see you again tomorrow night. So had ended the first day. Elias entered his room, stuck halfway between overwhelming frustration and confusion. On one hand, it hadn't gone poorly, and he had kept control of himself. On the other hand, he had accomplished nothing. Idling about and talking about brought him no satisfaction, no sense of accomplishment. Even scavenging had its ups, but everything he had done was just pointless. At least Elias felt so. Regardless, he removed the covers from his bed and curled up on the floor, feeling more comfortable with the support of the feathery mattress. The second day began much as the same as the first, Elias, for with Elias awake before noon due to his night terrors. Instead of going to the library, since it appeared Twilight had delivered the library to him, Elias decided to do some physical training. After dropping off the Roman military books with Anion, he collected his old armor and made his way to the practice field. Being in the middle of the day, it was empty, so Elias was free to do as he wished. He began with laps around the track, trying to get his strength back into his healed legs. After sweating through his tunic in the afternoon sun, Elias stripped the cloth garment off, keeping only his sword, belt, sandals, and briefs on as he ran through stance drills. While unpractical for a solitary fighter, Elias enjoyed the familiarity, familiarity the maneuvers gave him. At the very least, he got his muscles working as he swung his sword and blocked with an imaginary shield at invisible foes. 
As it became near at the time that Nightshade would come looking for him, Elias began to pack his equipment when an Enyon had flown down from the castle, a thick bundle in his arms. Ah, there, young blood. Thought you might find you here? The griffin squeaked excitedly as he landed. Elias watched Enyon as he held a bundle in one arm as he hobbled out about quickly on the other three. Despite the obvious impediment, the griffin moved quickly, likely well practiced at the maneuver. The old bird smiled widely as he left the bundle flop onto the table next to Elias' armor, undoing a length of rope, and Yan quickly spread the bundle apart, revealing Elias' shield, as well as half a dozen brand new pila. Elias carefully eyed the shield as he picked it up, inspecting it with both hands, and Yan grilled proudly. I might sure to get what was done first. I'll have your armor done by tomorrow, no doubt. You just had to make a few extra improvements to make it your sword. How's the little feather handling, by the way? Elias tilted his head as he ran his thumb along the shield's edge. She's not had to kill anyone yet, so I'd say pretty good. Enyan grinned. Aye, that's good. The griffin remained silent as Elias looked over his shield. Elias flipped it over, looking at the steel boss in the front. He could faintly see runic outlines embedded in the steel, glowing slightly when he got close. When Enyan noticed Elias' focus, he said... Strength, standard hardening enchantment. That boss should never tarnish or dent. You would take a mighty big swing to even scratch it. Elias nodded silently, holding his shield out at his arm's length so he could look at the full picture. The bright red and yellow was gone, replaced by a mixture of dark purple, blue, and some accents of silver. The designs, however, remained intact. Elias looked at Enyon. Are the Legion lightning bolts or Lunar Guard standard? The griffin scoffed. Nah, but none of the ponies are hardened shields either. I got permission from the princess to make your gear special, so I'm gonna make it special. Besides, it's a bit of home, ain't it? Elias nodded as he thumbed through the lightning bolts that ran diagonally across the scutum. He was unused to seeing the shield unmarred. He had gotten scratches on it the day it was made. Now, though, it positively gleamed in the sun as it sat ready for use, and then scoffed and motioned for him to hurry up. Come on now, shields ain't for gawking, they're for wearing. Try it on. Elias smirked and flipped the shield back over, gripping the steel's horizontal handle. Actually, this shield is for holding. The straps are for carrying it. Enyon came around Elias and looked at how he held it from behind, and then cocked his head. But you're bracing it with your wrists. That ain't a very sturdy grip. Elias nodded. Not alone, but when you hold it like this... He turned his body so his left side was facing out. The edges of the shield laid against his shoulder and knee. Your whole body acts as a brace, and formation makes it an incredibly strong form. Elias turned again, centering his grip on the scutum's handle. When you're in single combat, the shield can be punched with. He said, swinging the shield through the air. Elias grimaced as the motion sent a flash of pain up his left arm, but he ignored it as he reset his stance. Elias looked at Enyon, who was regarding him with curiosity. Does that make sense? Enyon frowned and stroked his chin. I guess. You seem to know what you're talking about. It just looks a bit odd for me. Maybe I'm just old. Elias shrugged. His eyes quickly fell into the pila, and he set the shield down, carefully picking out one of the long javelins as he inspected it. He looked down the shaft, making sure it was perfectly straight. The weight felt right perfectly balanced with weighted steel on both ends. And then looked cautiously at Elias as he ran his hands up and down the javelin, feeling for any consistencies in the wood. I tried following your book as best as I could. The design you wanted was easy to recreate. It didn't take me more than a few minutes to make cast for the heads, if you don't mind me asking. But what are the other types of these? The griffin paused before he snapped his claws. Pila, that was the word. Feels kind of weird. Elias nodded in understanding. Latin was by no means an easy language to learn, and if there was a language here that was already nigh identical, he could understand why new words might be difficult. Well, he started, falling into his lecture mode. The Romans always worried about their enemies taking their pila from their dead, and when then using them against other Romans, so they put an intentional fault into each pilum. Initially, it was just a weakness of the heads. They used softer metals so the tip would bend and break, but eventually they de developed designs that had the shaft break on contact, while another had additional weights to encourage the enemy to drop his shield. It was an ingenious move. It worked fairly well, too. 
Yanyo nodded in understanding. Sounds smart. Hope you don't mind. But these ain't got no faults. Elias smiled as he sent the javelin spinning through his fingers. No issue at all. Nobody knows how to throw these anymore. Except for me, of course. If somebody could throw one of these back at me, then they deserve to kill me. And then scoffed. Don't let the princesses catch you saying that. They'll try to make you soft with their friendship and such. Elias looked at the griffin. Says the guy who's been living on their roof for how long? Anon glared at him. You know what I meant, young blood. Just for that little remark, you gotta put on a show now. Elias looked around, suddenly becoming self-conscious. While they had been speaking, the day guards, as well as a few night guards that had begun filtering into the training grounds, very few of them were actually training, however. Primarily, they were staring at him and Anyon. Elias grabbed his watch from his sword belt and checked the time. Twenty minutes till six. He turned to Anyon. Look, I'm gonna be late. And Nightshade flipped out last time. Anyon just laughed. Ha! <laughs> no excuses, young blood. I rushed these peel out of yours out, and now I want to see how it's done. You don't even gotta put your fancy dress back on. Just show me how they're used. I'm curious. Elias opened his mouth to protest, then decided against it. It would be faster to just nail a target and be done. Elias grabbed his shield, sliding two pila into their sheaths. He then grabbed a third in his hand as he turned around, searching for an appropriate target. He quickly spotted a trio of straw dummies. Elias shut up, let out a th shrill whistle, then pointed to his target with his pila. Any ponies near the dummies moved away, while the rest watched intently. As Elias gauged the distance, he leaned over to Anyan. What'd you say? That is, uh, 200 feet? The griffin cocked his head, making it so his one eye was facing the dummies. I'm thinking 215. Elias rolled his shoulder as he rotated the peel on his hand, his fingers curling carefully around the shaft. I was thinking more of 212. Elias took a single step forward with his left foot as he pulled his right shoulder back. His right foot came down next, and his body curled over the limb. He let the pila go. His arm extended fully. Like a bullet, the spear sang through the air, taking the dummy in the head. Its neck snapped in two under the force, and the spear carried it off. Elias rolled his shoulders as he threw another pila from his shield. He winked as he gauged the second target. 2-11. The second pila tore through the dummy's torso, impaling it firmly. The shaft of the spear bounced slightly as the force was distributed through the target's body. Elias didn't notice, he had his eyes already on the third target, and the third pila sat in his hands ready to fly. 211 minus 2 inches. This pila stuck the post that served as the dummy's neck. Elias suspected that whatever Anyon had chanted the javelins with helped, but the spear cut clean through, and the head rolled away as the spear clattered against the stone wall. Elias winced as he lightly massaged his shoulder. He turned to a stunned looking Anyon, who set the shield back down with the rest of his equipment. Now imagine charging to a line of soldiers who can throw like that. A pilum is a nice tool in the right hands. Elias said. His hand was a bit scraped from gripping the second pila too tightly. He had meant for that one to take off the target's head as well, but they don't know, need to know that you missed. As he rubbed at the minor scrapes on his hands and prepared to go and retrieve his pila, he heard a shout across the training ground. He sighed as he looked at his watch. That little demonstration had cost him. Like a bat out of hell, Nightshade glided down, impacting a few feet from Elias, a look of fury on her face. Damn it, guardsmen, you are on explicit orders not to conduct strenuous activities, and here you are in the training grounds throwing spears! The Thestral shouted at him. Elias sighed, and he straightened out. Captain, I was just running some standard exercises. I didn't believe they would be considered strenuous. Then she glared up at him. I didn't ask what you believed, guardsman. This is the second time you have not been where you should be. If it hadn't seen a lot of idle hooves... She shouted, pointedly looking at all the guards watching the confrontation. When they all scrambled to look busy, Nightshade nodded in satisfaction before turning back to Elias. If I hadn't seen all those guards standing about, I would have sent out another escape alarm. You need to focus, Elias. I understand that you may feel bored, but if you keep pushing yourself like this... She sighed, her eyes looking down. <sighs> Look, you are a few bad days away from being strapped to a bed so that Scalpel can control every aspect of your life until you are deemed healthy. Nightshade looked up to Elias, 
and he couldn't help but to see sympathy in her orange eyes held. I get it, Elias. I really do. You need to move. You need to keep busy. I get it. I am more than sure that you have your reasons. But have you considered that maybe all of this is for your benefit? Maybe we're just trying to help you get better. Even if it don't want to admit it, the problem. Elias looked away. I know what the problem are. I don't sleep. I have anger problems. I got it. I'm an antisocial, potentially sociopathic freak. Too dangerous to be left alone. I'm a risk. Nightshade glared at him, and then just shook her head in disappointment. Get your gear, guardsman. We have a schedule to keep. The rest of the day had been a blur. After the incident at the training field, another guard had been assigned to watch Elias. If he hadn't felt like a prisoner before, having a constant shadow sealed it. It didn't help that the pony seemed to have some animosity towards Elias, though he had no idea what he did to cause it. In truth, he didn't care, and Elias made it painfully obvious that he was ignoring the pony. The rest of the afternoon was spent in Twilight's library, once again talking about Earth until his face turned blue. Once more, the notes piled high, and once more, the purple unicorn passed out somewhere around midnight before she quit. Elias rubbed at his eyes when Luna began to silently stare at him once again, repeating her technique from the previous day. Except today's stare was less of a calm gaze and more of a hardened gla glare. Elias responded by not even looking at her, and then finding interest in the far wall. It was somewhere around three when Luna spoke. Why were you at the training grounds today, Godsman? Elias barely registered the question for a moment, and when he did, he looked at her, tilting his head slightly as he sat up on his chair. For the same reason I came to the library yesterday. I need to keep myself occupied. Whether it's physical or mental, I have a drive to do something. He shrugged. The training grounds is merely a way for me to start getting in shape again. Not a very useful guard if I don't keep my training up. Luna frowned. Nor are you a useful guard if you keel over and die. Yet it had been iterated several times that you need rest. And yet you seem both keen to avoid it, as well as unwilling to accept help in finding it. Elias shrugged. I get enough rest to get by. As long as I find food, which, thanks to you, hasn't been an issue, I'm fine. I can keep going as long as I need to. My throws at the training ground prove that, at least. That is what concerns me most, guardsmen. Despite clear mental, physical, and emotional deterioration, your body seems completely intact. Ignoring your injuries and deficiencies, it is most unnatural, and it concerns me to say the least. Then why give me this? Elias said, tapping his gladius. Why give me any of it? Why the whole guard business? Why the fancy room? The medical treatment? And the food? Why? I don't get it. Of everything that has happened since I've gotten here, I still haven't figured out the last part. His tone shifted, becoming more aggressive as anger grew. And what, he did not know, but Elias could feel his rage boiling in his gut. Why? Why do you care? Why does anyone care? What have I done to earn any of this? He snapped. Nothing, Godsman, Luna replied calmly. You have not earned the treatment you have received. Elias threw his hands up. Then why am I receiving it? Why am I the only one that gets to sleep safe and sound every night, instead of literally anyone else who is more deserving? Why do I get a bed with a full stomach when I know damn well that somewhere on Earth, a hundred go hungry? Why the hell is it me? He shouted. Elias was on his feet now. He held his anger glare at Luna for only a second before he turned away, holding a hand over his mouth as he mulled. He opened his mouth once more, then once, and then he began to say something, then shuddered the thought away, crushing it, brutally as his thoughts tried to keep anything important tampered down. Eventually, he just grunted in anger. <sighs> Princess, if you don't mind, I'd like to be alone. Luna nodded. Of course, Godsman. I shall see you tomorrow night. That brought Elias to now. He stared at the cell bars that he heard a door slam shut. Voices echoed through the dungeon, and he briefly wondered how much of that anger was directed at him. Elias smirked, closing his eyes once more as he sat. Apparently, trying to leave the castle with nothing more than a bundle of rope and a knife left a bad, almost suicidal impression on the guards. His flippant disregard for their questions likely didn't help. 
He hadn't made it more than twenty steps outside the gate before he was lifted in a magical aura and lifted back inside, quickly deposited in a cell. When he began playing with a knife by tossing into the air, maybe it could have been viewed as childish, but Elias didn't care. If he wanted to act childish in this insane environment of talking ponies and magic, he would do so. It wasn't like he got to live through most of his childhood anyway. Elias heard a deep sigh, and he cracked open his eyes to find Luna standing in the cell doorway, her face covered with a disappointed stare. Hello, princess, Elias said cheerfully, coming to visit the suicidal monkey. Her haze gardened. That was a very foolish action, guardsman. You could have been seriously injured. Elias snorted. Please tell me you don't honestly believe what the gate guards said. If I really wanted to die, I had had an arrow on my chest less than a week ago. I could have more than solved the issues then. Luna sighed, the disappointment dripping from her tone. Elias, is this truly what you want? To sit in a cell, wasting the rest of your days tortured inside, while the world continues around you? Elias shrugged, giving no verbal answer. Another sigh came from Luna. What exactly is this supposed to prove, Elias? And to who? She asked. What do you have to gain from this behavior? I will not pretend to know your tragedies, but whoever you lost, is this the life they would want, want from you? Elias smiled. He knew that he would be dragged out against him. He looked to Luna, a smile wide on his face. Yes, I think they would, he replied smugly, because I am still, and will always act as a protector, even if nobody else can know what they're being protected from. He gestured to the cell walls around him. This is where I belong, princess. This or a grave. Not because of what I've done, but because of what I know. He chuckled darkly and stared at his legs. Knowledge is power, he said mockingly. And I have knowledge that can bring about the end of your world. Just like it did mine. If a cell is what it takes to remain silent, so be it. Torture and solitude aren't new to me. He scratched the back of his head and laughed. <laughs> even if both are willing and of my own design. He didn't look back up. Didn't feel like listening to the judgments of Luna. She no doubt had more to say, but Elias didn't want to hear it. He knew he was right. Some things should never be shared. And for him, that was over half of his life. Elias did look up when he heard the door shut, with the pony princess inside the bars, rather than out. Elias watched the key turn in the lock before disappearing altogether. He looked at Luna with a sigh. What are you doing, princess? He asked. She sat down beside him, far enough away that they weren't touching, but close enough that he could feel her body heat. She settled until she was comfortable, and then looked at him. I am waiting for you. Despite your wishes to remain alone in a cage, I shall not let you. This is supposed to be a punishment, so you shall remain here, with me until I decide you are fit to be out on your own again. Elias shook his head and looked away. You are a ruler of a nation. Is this really the best use of her time? He asked. Luna laid her head on the stone floor and closed her eyes. I can perform much of my duties here, the important ones at least. Captain Nightshade will handle the rest. And if she needs my presence, then she will push off the work until we are free from this place. Elias smirked. Your solution to the mentally deranged human that would rather sit in a cell than go to therapy is to lock yourself in with him. He chuckled as he looked to Luna. How are we supposed to get out, princess? I don't have a key, and I have none of the tools I need to pick the lock. The key, the door is keyed to your magical signature, Elias. It shall open when you touch it. And Elias' grin widened. And how precisely is that supposed to work when I have no magical signature? He asked. Luna scoffed. All living things have a magical signature from the ponies to the grass. Even a creature from a different realm should have magical signature. Elias raised an eyebrow. Really? How much are you willing to stake on that? He got to his feet, walked to the cell door. He reached a hand out but stopped short. Looking back to Luna. Are you really 100% sure that this door will open? Because I am 100% sure that it won't. Luna frowned at him. 
I do not appreciate your doubts of my abilities, Elias. I can cast a magic detection spell as well as any pony, and I identified your signature as soon as Dr. Scalpel finished his initial healing sessions. That door is key to that signature. Elias didn't break eye contact as he firmly grasped the bar and tried to rattle it. The steel didn't so much as budge. The anger in Luna's eyes turned to disbelief. She shot to her feet. That's impossible. I am quite certain I did it right. She got close to the bars and watched him intently, motioning for him to pull the sealed door again. So he did, to the same result. Elias wanted to laugh as he saw her eye twitch in disbelief. But, but, but I scanned you, she shouted. I have used that spell a hundred times. I know the signatures of every pony in Canterlot Castle. Elias chuckled as he moved away from the bar, resuming his seat on the floor. He threw his hands over his knees as he watched the pony try to figure out where she went wrong. Elias already had a theory, but he wanted to see how long it took her. When she began to mumble to herself in pace, he decided to throw her a bone. When did you do your scam? He asked simply. Luna looked at him, her eyes narrowed. I do not see how that matters. The time does not impact the spell result. No, but I imagine who is nearby, say, casting healing magic might. Elias replied smoothly, his smile poking back out now. Now, I'm no expert on magic, but I think we can both logically figure out where you found my magic signature. Luna stopped, then looked between Elias and the cell door, and then back to Elias as the realization dawned on her. Elias could almost see the pieces falling together in her eyes. I... I scanned Dr. Scalpel? She cried out on the top of her lungs. I detected his signature from the healing spells and identified that as your signature. We shall be stuck in here for days! She let off a string of what Elias assumed were explicatives in some old pony tongue. Elias let her freak out for a moment before she spoke again. Can you not some sort of message out it with your magic? Praxa, whoever is on the guard these cells? Luna moaned and thumped her head against the wall. Nay, these dungeons seal off all magic save for the ambient ones. We haven't had a permanent guard here for centuries. They were designed specifically to contain my sister and I, as a precaution, of course. Being the most powerful being in Equestria is a threat, and we wanted to never be without a failsafe. And yet I'm viewed as insane for trying to isolate myself, Elias muttered. Luna scoffed as she resumed her pacing. You might have knowledge that you deem forbidden, but your physical prowess is limited. My sister and I raise and lower the sun and moon. It is hardly comparable. Luna stopped, then pounced on Elias like a cat, startling him as he got right into his face. Of course! When I feather lower the moon, Tia shall come looking. It is the perfect escape plan. Elias tried to lean away, but found his stone blocking his skull. He cleared his throat. Ah, uh, princess? Luna seemed to come down from her excited high, quickly realizing what she was doing. She hopped back up, combing her flowing hair with a hoof as she fell back to her normal professional demeanor. Elias spotted a tinge of red on her face as she refused to meet his eyes. My apologies, guardsman. I may have been over-enthusiastic. Elias nodded dumbly. Right. It's fine. Sun up shouldn't be too far off anyway. Luna settled onto the stone once more, huffing as she laid her chin on the floor. I cannot believe I made such a foolish mistake. A fool should have noticed the similarities in magical signatures. She gave an exasperated groan at the ceiling. Elias returned to staring at the wall, but found that he had nothing left that he wanted to think about. Boredom was his ultimate enemy, as it allowed dark parts of his mind freedom. So he looked at Luna, who was still pouting on the floor. Elias looked away, didn't know how to start a conversation. What did he have to talk to a pony princess about? He stared back at the wall, his gaze boring into the smooth gray material. The only thing of note on the wall was the fact that the wall itself was featureless. And therefore worthless for occupying his mind. Elias didn't know why it was suddenly hard to just not think. He had been fine for hours before Luna had decided to initiate her scheme. Speaking of the devil, she huffed again, and Elias caught her glance at him. Though it occurred in less than a second, when Elias began to shift his eyes forward again, she sighed loudly. Elias remained silent. Luna sighed louder, and her wings fluttered slightly. 
Elias crossed his arms across his chest, confident that he could wait the pony out. Whatever she was doing, he closed his eyes as he listened to Luna taking a long gobble of air before loudly exhaling, shifting about as she did so. Elias scratched his head as he tried to tune the pony out. Eventually, when she stopped her squirming and sighing, Luna shot up, glaring at Elias. Godsman, you are supposed to ask if I'm all right. Elias looked at her with one cracked eye. Why? Luna crossed her hooves. Because this is a lesson to teach you about being a good friend. If nothing else, it is a lesson about checking on your princess. Elias raised a finger. First, we aren't friends. We do not know each other at all. He raised a second finger. Second, we won't be friends. Because I don't make friends anymore. I learned that lesson enough times. He lifted the third finger as he closed his eyes and faced forward once more. Third, I can see you. Right next to me. Completely safe and sound. You are uninjured, and besides the means of the cell, you aren't even restrained. You're fine. And if you want to really be technical, I'm not even a guard yet. He dropped his hands and exhaled deeply. He could feel Luna staring at him, though he couldn't tell what emotion was on her face. When he opened his eyes to check, he saw halfway between anger and sadness. We are not friends, she asked. Elias sighed. No, and for good reason. Beside our names, what do we know about each other? He looked at the pony. Do we know each other's birthdays, our favorite hobbies, our deepest fears? No, we know none of that. At best, you are my teacher slash therapist slash boss. He snorted. At worst, you're my warden. Though, he paused and gestured toward the closed cell doors. I am rather interested in your warden strategies. Locking yourself with a potentially dangerous human seems like a tactical error to me. The anger evidently won out, because Luna's next statement was at a furious yell. I know what I'm doing, Godsman. Maybe being locked in here with you was an elaborate strategy to get you to open up so we can help you. Elias chuckled. And how is that strategy working out for you, Princess? Yielding the results he wanted? Luna growled at him. It wouldn't be if there wasn't a stubborn human who refuses aid in any way. The anger suddenly disappeared from both her tone and posture as she laid back down, scooting closer to Elias. He eyed her carefully, and then she flashed a smile in return. So, Godsman, you have pointed out several faults in my plan, so I shall thank you by getting to know you better that we might be better friends. We can't be better friends if we aren't friends at all, Elias said. Luna huffed. Fine. Have it your way, Godsman. Then I am merely inquiring information so that I may be able to understand if you are a safety hazard or not for my subjects. Does that suffice for a reason? Elias sighed and rubbed his face. Morning couldn't come soon enough. On two conditions. One, I don't want to answer a question. I'm not answering it. Second, I'd like to ask some questions in return. Luna perked up and clapped her hooves together. Excellent! Marvelous first step, Godsman. We shall be friends before the sunrise. Elias waited in silence for the first question. When it didn't come, he cracked an eye open, to find Luna sitting directly in front of him with a wide, creepy smile on her face. Elias really didn't like that smile. Princess, what are you doing? he asked. I am sitting in front of you, Godsman, she said, her voice chipper. That doesn't seem like a good first question, but to each their own, I suppose. Elias resisted the urge to smack himself in the face. Luna adjusted as she sat up taller, sitting straight as she looked at the slouched human. So, Godsman, when is your birthday? Elias stared at her. Really? Luna tutted. Now, Godsman, you've already got a question. It is my turn, and I wish to know your birthday. Fine. July 14th. Luna pouted. Unfortunate. Your birthday has already passed this year. The celebrations are most enthusiastic. And there are wonderful moon pies. A shame. She looked up, her smile returning. What is your next question, Godsman? You said something about ambient magic. What is it? Luna pondered the question for a second before answering. Well, to begin... There are three ambient magics. 
Song, Dream, and Life. All sentient creatures are capable of accessing the first two at any time, while the third exists in everything, from the stones to the trees to the ponies. Everything has life magic, even if only in small amounts. Elias nodded. Except me, he said, pointing a thumb at his chest. Luna frowned and shook her head. I simply made a mistake when detecting your magical signature, Godsman. That does not mean you have no signature. As I said, everything has ambient magic within. That includes you. Elias shook his head. I'm afraid not. On Earth, there is no dream magic. I won't even ask what song magic is, and there is no life magic. We simply shrugged. Don't have anything. Human magic is just illusions and parlor tricks. Looked like fun, but it's all sleight of hand. That cannot be true, Luna denied adamantly. It is a definite rule of existence. The sun and moon require magic for motion, friendship has magical power, and everything has magic within. It is a fact. Elias chuckled. Then I'm going to put you for a spin when I say that the sun doesn't move, at least not on Earth. Maybe here it needs to be controlled, but on my world, we rotated around it. It's what gave us the seasons. Luna scoffed. T your world sounds ludicrous. It sounds like a perfect home for discord. So random and directionless. She paused, then added, No offense, Godsman. Elias shrugged. I'm taken. Maybe if things had been more coordinated, humanity might not be on its death throes. Let's move on. Luna nodded in agreement before smiling again. Elias was beginning to become unnerved by that smile. It seemed like it was trying forcefully to be genuine, but failing miserably. So, Godsman, what is your favorite hobby? Elias sighed and ran his hand over his face. It was going to be a long night. There we go. This is part one of chapter eight. This has been Firehearth. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day.